church. The rest of you, why don't you stand? We're going to be reading God's Word. Stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. We're going to be back in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. We'll be focusing particularly on verse 2. Hear God's words. It says this. You've heard it. <laughs> they're really excited. They're really scared. <laughs> you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. This since the reading of God's holy and errant and infallible word. May the grass wither and the flower fade, but may the word of our God, may it stand forever. You may be seated, though. Well, on the show... Um, that was actually filmed over not too far from here in the Sonoya area of Georgia. The show Walking Dead, it's a series about a group of human survivors that seek to stay alive in the midst of a zombie apocalypse. I know many of you probably watched this show. Many of you, I, I can tell just looking at you, many of you love that whole genre of the zombie apocalypse genre. Now, within the show, the, the main driving force that, that creates the action and the suspense within the show are, of course, the, the zombies, the zombies. But the characters throughout the show, that what they, the way they refer to these zombies is not usually as zombies, but here's how they refer to them. They refer to them simply as walkers. Thus the title, The Walking Dead. Ephesians 2, chapter, verse, chapter 2, verse 1 says, We were dead, but we were walking. You were dead in your sins, in which you once walked. You were dead, but you were walking. We were dead in sin, and we were walking. We were the walking dead. We were the zombie apocalypse. The New Testament takes up this metaphor of walking, and it talks about it often in the Christian life. Paul, in particular, will use this metaphor of walking to describe the Christian life as a means of describing, in particular, the spiritual direction of your life. What is the direction of your life? You're walking in that direction. What are the principles that guide and shape? What is the path that you're walking on in your life? Is it guided by the Word and the Spirit? But also, it refers, as we see here, not just positively to the Christian spiritual life, the positive approach, moving towards God, walking in the way of God, but also walking in regards to the spiritually dead life. That their direction, their guiding principles follow something else. And what Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3, 3 tell us is that being spiritually dead is characterized by following an unholy trinity. You have heard of these three. If you were to read the Bible and read the New Testament, you would find that throughout Paul's writings and other writings of the New Testament, there are all these challenges that say, hey, live the Christian life in this way, combating the flesh combating the temptation of the evil one, combating living opposite the ways of the world. This is the unholy trinity. And the reason why I want to actually dive back into verses 1 through 3, because you were like, oh, all right, we, I thought we were done with this. You said dead a lot over the over a couple, course of a couple weeks. And I'm not going back to this because I enjoy saying the word dead a hundred times in a sermon. But I'm going back to it because I want to help us understand and look at this unholy trinity. Because the things that, that what is opposes us as Christians, and to understand the depths of what we've been saved from, we have to understand what we once followed. And these three all go together. The world, the flesh, and the devil. This is the unholy trinity. The unholy alliance of the world, the flesh, and the devil. They're like the Axis powers of World War II, Germany and Italy and Japan. That they are bound together to form a reign of terror upon this world, terror, havoc, horror, and destruction. And that's what the world, the flesh, and the devil bring. And while the force of this unholy alliance are mentioned in scattered ways, there are very few places in the New Testament in which they are most clearly summarized as being joined together as here in verses 1 through 3. And so I want to go back, 
reverse where we've been, go back and look at some of the details here in verses 1 through 10, looking in particular at these three, this unholy alliance, and we're going to give a week to each of them. While we looked at verses 1 through 10 in summary over the course of the couple weeks leading up to Easter and after Easter, and articulating this great summary of the gospel, I want to go back now and look at five words, five words in verses 1 through 10, to look more specifically at each of them and do a, more, a deeper dive in helping us understand what we have been saved from and what we have been saved into. And so we're going to look at the words world, devil, flesh, and then grace and faith. If I could give this we could call this a five-week mini-series within the larger series of Ephesians. And if I were to give this mini-series a title, I would call it, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was lost, and so that's what we start with. We start with the unholy alliance, the world, the devil, and the flesh. And this morning, we look at, we look at the world. What is meant by the world? When it says here, that we once, in our deadness and sin, that we followed the course of the world. What is meant by the word world? Now, there has been made much, in my lifetime at least, about how bad the world is. There has been something about the instinct of the American church for the last 50 or 60 years. I'm not sure how much of it has been the sexual revolution, or maybe uh, this has happened throughout the history of the, of, of the church. In fact, it probably has. But it does seem like an emphasis of the American church for the last 50 or 60 years has been this. That we must protect our children. And we, indeed, we must protect ourselves from the influence of the world. The influence of the world. And much has been made about the denigration of society. The loss of the influence by the church. That the, the world's influence on our kids' lives. They listen to terrible music and they watch these terrible shows. And these things we point to and we say, that is the world and we must avoid it. But understand, there has been in the midst of these conversations a lot of confusion about the, what the world is. In large part, it's confusing because, frankly, the Bible doesn't kind of adds to the confusion in some ways. Because the word world, as it's used in the Bible, the Greek word being cosmos, where we get the word cosmetology, or I'm sorry, not cosmetology, the cosmopolitan, the world, the world as it is, the world cosmos, the world, the universe, is, is a flexible word as it's used in the New Testament. It can mean, it has various meanings and, or different levels, the, the breadth and scope of its meaning. And so let's understand it just really briefly. Help me help you understand what the word world means. Sometimes the word world is used in the Bible as simply referring to the spatial habitation of human beings, referring generally to all the things that God has made, the created universe. Broadly speaking, it involves all creation, all the universe, and more specifically speaking, it refers to the humanity that resides within that creation, humanity itself, and the mass of physical human beings that reside in this world can be referred to as the world. This involves both the visible and the material and the human world. But then there is this meaning of the word world that is pressed deeper and refers to what we might call the spirit of humanity, referring to the system, the pattern, and the principles that drive every aspect of humanity. This, this system and this pattern shapes our thinking, it shapes our feeling, our living, it shapes our institutions, our organized life, our family life, our work life, our government, our polity. But it goes beyond that in the breadth of meaning as well to a sense of combining both that physical, visible, and material world with that spiritual system that I was just talking about. That they're joined together. That the spiritual system that reigns in and through and over this human humanity actually begins to make itself evidenced and known in the material world. You see, the system, the pattern and principles that drive the world shape what we experience visibly and materially. We would believe, for example, that the evil that drives humanity, and maybe in regards to the way we view sexuality, has brought about some evil organizations. It is organizations such as pornography sites and human trafficking organizations, right? That is the spiritual being made manifest in the visible physical world in which we can see it. 
And so what we might say is that the spiritual world that is driving these principles of thought and feeling and belief that drive humanity and inform institutions and organizations and philosophies and ways of living, we might call this a kingdom. Or maybe for shorthand, we might just simply call it the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world. We might say that it is a kingdom in that it has a spiritual a spirituality at its root and its principle, but is made manifest in the physical, societal, relational, cultural, and material worlds. It, is, it touches everything. And one way to understand the, the story of the Bible is to see it as a story of two kingdoms. The kingdom of this world, and what Jesus calls in his teaching the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. The Bible makes clear that in following the world in the deadness of our sin, we were not following something that was morally neutral. 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says this. He calls us, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. What you see there is two competing mindsets. Two competing ways of viewing life, of desires. Indeed, the way the Bible talks about the kingdom of this world, or simply what I might call the world, is actually as a pulsating, animating, forming, and transforming kingdom that is given such life in the way it's spoken of. It's so organic and animate that the Bible will actually refer to it in personalized terms. For example, in John chapter 15, verses 18 through and 19, Jesus says this, If the world hates you, it's speaking of the world almost as if it's a person. If the world hates you, it's personalized. You know that it has a, a hatred. It hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. He's speaking of the world and this, this kingdom of this world as, in a personalized way. That it is this organic, animating thing that will actually form and transform, is actually responding and acting upon you and in your life. And so the world, we might say, is this. Is the morally active kingdom that is animated by a hatred and antithesis to God and his kingdom. The world is the morally active kingdom that is animated by a hatred and antithesis to God and his kingdom. And in that antithesis to God, the world has taken physical, material, visible world, and it has misused it. And in fact, it has co-opted it and enslaved it for its own purposes. For example, God has created many wonderful and beautiful things, hasn't he? Many, even, even what we would say is human structures were formed by God. The, the idea of government is a gift from God. The idea that he would put people and form them into organizations to rule and, and help control and help actually bring life and beauty, that that is a good thing. And yet, what does the kingdom of evil do? The kingdom of this world uses that and corrupts it to bring destruction and devastation and injustice. The Bible is saying that God has ordained all of these areas of human life Sexuality, the family, the church, government, organization, economics, that God has formed these things, and yet these things, the evil world, the kingdom of this world, has sought to take these structures captive by spiritual powers, and so has used these things to become agents of rebellion. And this core assumption that we must discover is this, is are these institutions, and, or is this person living for or against God? Or what aspects of these institutions, or this family, or this person's life is for or against God? Are they living for the kingdom of this world? Or are they living for the kingdom of God? Understand that God loves his creation. He called it good. He formed it, and he made these things. And he's ticked. He's ticked that what he called good and beautiful, that the kingdom of this world has taken and made something twisted and malignant and nasty out of. So that's the world. That's the world. We are to hate that aspect of the world. Now, really quickly, as a, just a clarific clarification, it also says Jesus died for the world. It also says Jesus loves, so loved the world. And that meaning his material created world. 
He comes to redeem it because there is something, when he looked at the world and when he formed it, what's the first thing God said about his world? He said, that is good. And then he saw humanity and he said, that is very good. So God is calling us to be against the world and the kingdom of this world, but in so being in order to redeem the world, the material world, to redeem humanity, to bring it under his rule and his reign. Now the passage does not simply say, though, that in our deadness to sin, we followed the world. It actually gets something more specific here. It says that we followed the course of this world. And so let's get even... Don't you find this to be a rather bony sermon so far? I, I, I woke up this morning rather early, and Meredith saw, saw me in, on the couch doing this, and she goes, what's wrong? And I said, my sermon is so bony. It's so teachy. So I'm sorry about the teachiness, the didacticness of this, and for the questions and definitions but um, it'll have to do. What is the course of this world? What is the world, and now what is the course of this world? That word course is an interesting one in the Greek. Yes, we're getting even more bony. It is the word ion, ion, or eon is how we might pronounce it. You may have heard of the phrase, oh, that was eons and eons ago. What does that refer to? An eon is an indefinite period of time, or as it is often referred to in the literary world as an age. Oh, that was the eon. That was the age. And when we're referring to something as an age, we refer to something perhaps we, we would say we are in the technology age. We're saying that it's a period of time that is defined by particular characteristics. And when it says it is we follow the course of this world, it's saying that we followed the defining characteristics of the world. We were shaped by the pattern of the defining characteristics of this world. That is the image that it's being given here. That you, in your deadness of sin, you followed the course, the trajectory, the pattern. You lived according to the mold of the world. And I think that word mold is actually quite appropriate. That you followed the, the molding of the world. You ever seen hot metal, how they form it and shape into something useful? What do they do? They pour that hot metal into a mold to shape it in a certain way. And that is kind of the image that Paul has here. What he is saying is that in your lost and dead state in sin, you were molded like that hot metal, molded into the defining characteristics and the principles that shape the world. That you are formed like the pattern of this world. You are being actively shaped and formed and fashioned to fit the priorities of this world in your deadness to sin. And understand that this shaping was an unstoppable force in your life. Like a mold that shapes hot metal or a cookie cutter shaping dough, this forming was a pervasive and irresistible pressure that was placed upon our lives by the world. So understand this, and this is critical to understand. This world, this kingdom, who in Galatians Paul calls it the elementary principles, is their elementary principles are this, Anything but God. Anything that is against God. And that was the shaping form and pattern of your life. And indeed, the world still seeks to shape you in that pattern and that mold. The kingdom of this world seeks to shape out of every part of who you are, your emotions, your thoughts, down to the deepest desires of your heart, to mold you in such a way that everything in your life is an antithesis and is against God himself, because that is the principle and the pattern of the worlds. And the world permeates, permeates us with immense pressure, it permeates your mind and your heart by what we might call gradual brainwashing, to which you become completely oblivious to it, to form you and to shape you to fit this antagonism against God's. And Christians, understand this. And this is important the way we talk about it. the pervasiveness and how it permeates everything it means that we have to be rather holistic in the way we talk about the world. For example, when I was a kid, we talked often about the influence of the world as being not listening to certain types of music or playing certain violent video games or watching certain movies. Are those things the world? Yes. Yes. Those things are being used to try to permeate and shape your mind and your heart. And yet we also have to understand that the world will also seek to shape all organizations, all philosophies and worldviews to shape you as well, which means this. Can the world seek to shape an organization like a church 
to shape you in antagonism against God? Yes, absolutely. Both of these things are true. And therefore, it, we should not be like the vacillation of various generations, right? Some generation says, hey, here's how you avoid the world. You avoid the movies and the TV shows and the music. And then the next generation comes along and says, no, 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 we are far more erudite than that. You can watch the movies and listen to, the, listen to whatever you want to. What the real evil is is the greediness of capitalism. Or what the real evil is is the terror that is Marxism. And another person comes along and says, now this worldview and this philosophy is what's really destroying us. And I want you to see is this. That's all true. They're all trying to form you and to shape you into this. They're all trying to say, you should be against God. They're all trying to form you into a, having a heart that is antagonistic to God and his kingdom. And it's a, seeking to do that in some ways, very blatant ways, right in your face, and sometimes in ways that are deeply unconscious to you. Now, which ways do you think are actually more dangerous, though? That is a question. The ways in which it's obvious that the evil one is seeking to actually lead you astray, or are there ways in which it's like, oh, this is pervasive, and it's permeated my life, and I didn't even know it. It happens all over the place. You see, we, we think in terms of, we can think of terms of like what is obvious to us, and then we also have to think of terms of some things that may be a little bit less obvious to us. Take the fact that in the last 20 years, we've become a digital age and the social media world. Think about how this has formed you. Now, we tend to think of that as we get on and we say, listen, the digital age, here's what you have to avoid. You need to avoid pornography, and you need to avoid the, seeing these things and watching these kind of videos, and I would say, yes, that's also true. But did you also understand that the very use of social media is forming and shaping us in a particular way? It's answering questions about who we are and how we view the world. So you can be looking at nothing but dog videos and kitty cat videos on social media, and that can, still it can be forming and shaping your life. Understand this, that all of these things we might say are religious. Amazon is a religious site. It is a religious site. Listen to this quote from a man named James K. A. Smith. He's a sociologist and philosopher who wrote a book called You Are What You Love. I, I put this in too late, and it's not, this quote isn't going to be up on the board, but listen along with me as I read. He said this, We often hear about brand loyalty, even brand devotion, but do people really, really worship brands? Is consumerism really such a worship experience? It may not be as far-fetched as you might think. In a recent study to consider the effect of super brands, such as Apple and Facebook, researchers made an intriguing discovery. When they analyzed the brain activity of product fanatics, like members of the Apple cults, they found that the Apple products triggered the same part of the brain as religious imagery triggers in a person of faith. That is your brain on Apple. In other words, it looks like worship. It appears to be innocuous. There appears to be nothing wrong with it. It's a computer. It's, Im it's imaged in a certain way, and yet what is it doing? It's trying to form what you love and what you desire and how you think. This means we should say, oh, yes, we need to ask ourselves questions, not just simply about what we're looking at and what we're listening to, but also what are our practices and what are our habits and how is the world shaping us in ways that we don't actually ever think about? Shaping us in the way, the speed with which we live our life. Shaping the way in which we view material things, in which the way we view other human beings. And so we need to ask the questions. Yes, the music is trying to shape me. The movies are trying to shape me. But also, also, my church or certain religious organizations in which the evil one may have in the world may actually pervaded their, in their thinking and their desires may also be shaping me as well in a way that is not pro-God's. And so, the implication of following the course of this world is this, is the pervasiveness of the world affects everything. Everything. It affects the way you think. And it captures your mind. The natural man is described in our passage as living his life in the course and the pattern set out for him by the world. He may think of himself as a free thinker, but he's actually being molded. Molded. He's being molded and shaped Understand, it's, it's so crazy. Think about how far the scriptures communicate of how the world can shape us. It can even shape your sorrow. We think of sorrow, like, that is utterly immoral. 
But 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, But for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Even, it pervades even your sorrow. And so understand that when we were dead in sin, we had no way out. All paths lead to being against God. You see, it was like we were living in a maze. You ever done like one of those little kids' activity books and it's a maze and you got to trace it and you got to, there's a beginning and you try to find the exit to the maze? Well, understand this, that in the kingdom of this world, you may trace that maze in a thousand different directions. They will all end to a wall that says this, against God. That's the wall. And that, that maze can look religious it can look conservative, it can look progressive, it can look hedonistic, it can look materialistic, it can look a thousand different ways. But the end goal, the end goal, the way the world wants to shape us is against God. And so the course, what does that mean? The course, I'll define it this way, is the force and influence of this world to form and shape every part of our lives towards hatred and resistance against God and his kingdom. And so we say that we've, if we follow in the course of this world, it's actually saying that not only was, was fear forming of the world upon us irresistible, but we'd say that we did not resist at all. We were dead in sin. We were like dead bodies being floating along, along a river. And it was forming and shaping you as it pushed you along. We happily went along with it. We didn't even recognize that the world was shaping us and leading to us against God and to death itself. To be of the world can be summed up like this. It is to have life, thought, and life, everything apart from God. It is an attitude towards everything, towards God, ourselves, towards this life that is against God and is lived apart from God. And the fact is the matter is that the whole thing of the world seeks to conform you to this pattern, anti-Godness, anti-God's kingdom. So that's some bad news. Well, verses 2, 1 through 3 is a lot of bad news. So let's try to We're seeing this now in perspective, having looked at verses 2, 1 through 10. We've already heard the but God sermon, and by grace you've been saved through faith. But now let's look at how the by grace you've been saved through faith actually applies particularly to this idea of following the course of this world. How to be saved from this world. How to be saved from this world. I love what it says at the end of verse 5. But by grace you've been saved. Saved from what? Well, one of the nuances of God's salvation is saved from following the world. You've been saved from the influence, the deadly influence and shaping of the world. It says in 1 Timothy 1.15 that Jesus came to save us. And where did he come to save us? He came into the world to save sinners, to save us from the world. He came to remove us from the sinking ship that is the world. I I've used it a number of times, the illustration of the idea that we are not simply a people who are in a boat and we need to reach up to God. And that's how we're saved. And grab onto the rope of Jesus. That's how we're saved. No, we are a people who are sinking to the bottom. We were already dead. But if I were to actually add this kind of dynamic and element is we were in a dead ship. We were in a ship that was sinking. In fact, the ship itself was helping carry us to the bottom. That ship is the world's. That it had a hold of us. That if you're in the hole of a ship, if you're a soldier in World War II and your boat gets torpedoed and you can't get out of that ship, that ship becomes your tomb and the instrument of your death. And so it is with us. We were spiritually dead and the world was an anvil tied around our legs to ensure that we were pulled to the bottom of the ocean floor. But God. And he came to rescue us from what? The dominion of darkness. Colossians 1.13 says this. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. Think kingdom of this world, kingdom of this world, and transferred us to what? The kingdom of his beloved son. And how did he do this? By entering the world and by resisting the world. And he says, ultimately, he says, I have overcome the world. I want you to understand. Think, of, think with me about this. Think about all that Jesus overcame. We were dead in sin, and so we were pushed along in any way by the world, just dragged along. Jesus came alive to God, alive to his kingdom, which means he felt the full weight and pressure of the kingdom of evil up against him, trying to drag him into sin itself, and yet he resisted the pull and the temptation, the forming mold of the world against him. And he felt it, he felt the pressure of it, and yet he resisted 
Think about Jesus in the, in the temptation in the wilderness. Think about what the evil one came and did. What did he offer him? He offered him bread. That's hedonism. He offered him power. He offered him worship. Religious forming of the world. The kind of civic, economic, governmental reign over the world. And even the hedonistic approach to being shaped by the world. And to each of them, Jesus said, yeah, no thanks. Yeah, no thanks. I've come to live for a different kingdom. And what came after Jesus, even in his death? Think about Jesus at his, at his own trial. What are the worldly evidences going on there? Evil men being wrought along and led by a spirit, an evil spirit, an evil kingdom, was formed into human institutions like what? The government of Rome. And sought to put him to death. Oh, it had a religious flair to it, didn't it? Because the religious leaders of Jerusalem. Oh, and then there's the mob. The mob. And they all conspire they all conspire to crush Jesus. And yet to all of them, Jesus, not only did he resist them, but it said that on the cross, he overcame them. The schemes, the institutions, the lies, he overcame them in his fight against sin. And if the world was a sinking ship of dead people, he dove into that world in order to drag you out, not just from death, but out of a sinking ship to bring you back to life. This is what he did. Pull us up to the surface to life with him. And this life with him, for the good news for us, has, has some elements to it that are completely, wonderfully contrary to the ways the world works. Let me give you three bits of the good news, the aspects of what Jesus did and saving us from following the course of this world. First, three bits of good news. First is this. We are brought into a new world called the kingdom of God. Understand the pervasiveness, the all-encompassing nature of what he brings us into with his salvation. That the kingdom of this world, <laughs> the kingdom of this world involves everything. Your thinking, your feeling, your belief system, how you live. Think about this, the great quote that we've done, said often around here by Abraham Kuyper, a, a great reformed thinker. He said this, there is no place in the world, in this earth, in the universe, where God does not look at and say, that is mine. We'll understand the opposite of the case as well. That the kingdom of this world says every aspect, your sexuality, your thought life, your vocational life, all those things, the kingdom of the world would like to say, that is mine. And therefore, when salvation enters your life, there's going to be a pervasive change that connects to everything in your life. It is not, I simply was saved spiritually, but that spiritual salvation then changes everything else. Because now you live for a whole new kingdom that it pervades every aspect of your life. Therefore, you work differently, and you think differently, and you view sexuality differently, and you view organizations differently. When God's kingdom breaks in, it breaks in, not simply with a few tweaks, but with an entirely different system and way of living. And so we are brought into the kingdom of God. We're brought into a whole new world where he covers our sins and removes us from this world so that we might be alive to a new kingdom, a new kingdom where everything is changed and radically transformed. There is a reversal here that is equally as pervasive and a holistic and all-encompassing as all the influences of the world. And therefore now, understand this, we can say this, because his salvation it doesn't simply change me spiritually. We can say that knowing Jesus and being in his kingdom, it changes everything. Everything. And therefore, we now get to participate in this alternative world. Did you know that you're a person who is now living in two worlds? I love what, what Paul says, how he introduced himself at the, at the beginning of Colossians. To the saints in Christ at Colossae. That this is now who you are. You are living in the world that is in Christ, his kingdom, and yet you also reside in this world. This is how, this is the perspective we are to have. This is a John 17 perspective where Jesus prays to the Father, I pray not that you would remove them from the world, but that they would overcome the world, that they would remain in my name. And therefore, what that means is we don't separate ourselves from the world, but we live for the new world as an alternative kingdom in this place, in this place living for him. But here, here's what that means. That means you're going to be in the midst of a battle, doesn't it? If you're going to live in two worlds, you're going to live for the kingdom of God while you're in the midst of enemy territory, that's not going to be easy. That's going to be difficult, and that's going to be hard. 
But there's more good news. There's more good news. The second aspect of the good news is this. We are given a new spirit to resist the world. We are given a new spirit to resist the world. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. In other words, we are brought into a new kingdom, but because God has left us in this world to function and work and labor for the, be- for the glorification of that kingdom, for the making it visible and manifest in this world, he also has given us his spirit so that we resist the old kingdom and bring about the new. Bring about the new. Our old spirit, when the world said, hey, ingest this philosophy that leads to death, we went, okay, great. I like that philosophy. I'll lick that. That's fine. Now we have the spirit of God who says, the world comes and says, hey, why don't you believe this in the spirit of God? No, no, I'm going to resist the foolishness of that worldview. The spirit is given so that we might live in the world and we are given power to resist the world. And that power is the power of who? The spirit of Christ. And Jesus says in John 16, I have overcome the world. And therefore, if Jesus overcome the world by that spirit and you've been given that same spirit, guess what you get? You can overcome the world too. 1 John 4, 4, little children, little children. I love that perspective because he's about to talk about how what immense power you have. You, we little kids, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The image here is almost of like a toddler dressed in an armor facing the demons and the dragons of this world. And yet they're strong because of the spirit of God. This is who you've been given to resist the world in order to reach the world. And third bit of good news is this. We are given ultimate victory. Ultimate victory. The new world wins. The old world goes away. The victory of the kingdom of God over the world and its system and its powers is guaranteed. It's guaranteed. And, and this is important for Christians to understand. There, has, there is much made the fact that it feels and appears like the world is winning. And doesn't it feel like it doesn't matter if you homeschool your kids? It doesn't matter if you put them in a box? It doesn't matter if you put them in a bubble? It doesn't matter, right? Doesn't it feel? Oddly enough, it's because... The world resides in your house. You're there. Stuff is there. Things are there. And so it it gets in. It seeps in. And so the question is, it it becomes demoralizing. uh, Are we just doomed? Are we destined to fail? Doesn't it feel like, I mean, all the, the amount of energy that Christians have put into the moral majority and the Christian coalition or the progressive versions of that, and we have been trying with all of our might, we've been pushing against it, our feet have been placed against the ground, and it just feels like we're being pushed back further and further and further, and we're losing? Doesn't it feel that way? Yeah. But in Christ's mind, we are not losing. In Christ's mind, we don't have to panic and cry. First John 2.17 says, the world is passing away along with its desires. It's on a highway to hell, and that is devastating. And we should cry out against it, and we should resist it. Not for, not for the sense of, this is how we win, but in order to win others for Christ. John 16.33, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. It's, we're we're going to resist, and we're going to get pushed on. There's going to be a war, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And the final goal, the final goal of Jesus is the destruction of every power in this world, every other contrary kingdom that says it is anti-God. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, 25, in view of the resurrection, this is what Paul says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after the what? doing what? Destroying every rule and every authority and every power, for he must reign until he has put his enemies under his feet. And so little children who are scared, little children who feel as if the influence of the world is crushing you. You ever feel that way in regards to your fight against sin? In which the, the influence of the world feels like, man, it's, right? that was bad news early on, right? It's everywhere. It pervades everything. How am I supposed to trust anything? It's in the church. It's in it's in 
everything. It's so pervasive. How do I resist that? Oh my goodness, the Spirit of God is with you, little child. The evil one, oh my gosh, he wants my kids. The world is trying to take my child. Yeah, yeah. But little child, who's also called parent, there is one who resides in you, and one who may reside in your children, called the Spirit of the living God. And so you plead to him. This is what, here's what this means for us as a church. I would simply say this, that the primary work that we do is spiritual. But then secondarily, it is made manifest and visible. It's spiritual. So you pray. You know, your primary work as parents is to pray, to pray, to pray, to resist the evil one. And then secondarily, you go and seek to make the kingdom manifest. Give your children, give the church, give it a better vision of a better kingdom that is way better than the kingdoms of this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, when we start getting into the... It's nice to talk... Dead in sin is so generic. It's really bad news. But Lord, when we start to get into the, the nuances of that deadness and sin, it gets really depressing really fast. When we consider the, the schemes of the evil one, the schemes of the world, and the pervasiveness of the world, the way it affects us and seeks to shape us, Lord, we can get scared really fast. And so, gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that eyes being opened to the pervasiveness of the world would actually make us run to you more quickly. That, Lord, this sense of that the, we're being pressed upon would make us run to Jesus, that we would hide ourselves in the rock that is Christ, that we cling to him more fully and more faithfully. And gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that when we cling to you, we discover a king. We can discover a savior who came into this world and who was not pressured into the mold of the world, but in when the world tried to crush him, he destroyed the world from the inside out. And he is bringing a new kingdom that is beautiful and that is glorious and that is lovely. And so I pray that we would live for that kingdom. Would your spirit come and give us the ability and the power to do that? We pray this in Christ Jesus. Amen.